Okay. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and just get started. I just wanted to introduce myself. I'm Audrey Angelo, the AE for Tri-County. I haven't had a chance to meet a lot of the membership since I started because soon after we started social distancing. But I wanted to welcome everybody. This is our first virtual Lunch and Learn program. Um, and we're looking forward to hosting a few more of these um, you know, over the next couple months while we're staying away from each other. And our first virtual Lunch and Learn host is First World Mortgage. And I'm just going to go ahead and turn it over to them. Um, Wayne Sweeney is going to go over kind of how to ask questions and um, introduce First World. So thank you, everybody, for coming. Yes, thank you all for joining us. Uh, good morning um, to our presentation on the real estate of lending. Uh, my name is Wayne Sweeney. I'm business development manager here at First World Mortgage. And we do want to make this interactive. So you do have the ability to ask us questions um, via the chat, which is at the bottom of the screen. Uh, if you move your mouse down there, you'll see chat. You can type us a question, uh, raise your hand, or um, you can uh, also speak uh, if you're um, new. And you, you, uh, your question out there. So we want to be able to keep this interactive. And um, I'm going to pass this over to my colleague, um, our mortgage consultant, Denise Lanuet. Hi, everybody. Thank you um, for taking the time today. I know, um, you know, these are challenging times. So thank you, Audrey, for having me. Thank you, Tri County. Um, as we in second, I just want to, um, you know, second his request. Please ask your questions. I know I have been fielding a lot of. Um, questions from referral partners who just kind of want to know what things are looking like on the lending side. Um, so if you have, I will go through, I think, and answer most of the questions that I'm getting most common. Um, but if there is something that additional that I don't get to, feel free to raise your hand. I'm happy to answer. Um, I want to take a, a few minutes and just tell you a little bit about myself. I know there was a bio somewhere in the mix. Um, but I first want to start, start off by saying I am not a salesperson. I kind of um, ended up in the mortgage industry by accident, I suppose. I um, thought I was going to be a psychologist. I was a psychology major, um, worked at a mortgage company through college and never got out. Um, and I didn't realize that at the time how much counseling would be part of the home buying process. So it's always funny to me, and I don't do this for the numbers. Um, math and guidelines and underwriting is kind of boring stuff, um, but I do it for the people. So that is kind of what keeps me going. There's nothing I love more than seeing somebody the day of closing who never thought it was possible. Um, and that, that is why I do this every day to keep going. And I found, um, I've worked for a few mortgage companies um, since the beginning, as I mentioned, you know, since going through college, I've been in the mortgage industry and first world, I landed here about two and a half years ago. Um, and they are by far the best mortgage company I have worked for um, ever. We, I'll go through and say a little bit about it because this is not a sales pitch, um, but I do want to let you know why, you know, first world is different and the reasons why. Um, we are, we have, we're, in Connecticut and Mass currently. Um, we have licenses in other states too, if anybody has Florida deals or does referral partners. Um, we are 30 years in business, so you can see all the things. We have local offices, but one of the best things, of course, is we are completely remote, which is very important during these times of social distancing. Um, we are absolutely fully operational through this entire process, start to finish, and we'll go through those things. Starting now. Uh, yeah, perfect. So we figured we would go ahead and start with the, you know, symbol you guys have probably been seeing far too often. We can't get away from it. Um, it is here, it is now. We kind of have to just embrace where we are. Um, and a lot of things have changed. Most importantly, there's a lot of things that haven't changed. And I hope you leave this meeting knowing that it is not all doom and gloom. There is a lot of stuff that is still happening. There's a lot of um, great things happening in the mortgage field right now. Real estate's still happening, of course, as you guys know. 
um, we're just doing things a little different. So if I can, beautiful. And I, I figured we would go through and start each. So I always break it down into four pillars, income, assets, credit, collateral. Those are really the four parts um, of real estate as we go from a lending perspective. So I'll go through each one of these items and then we'll talk about what has changed, what is still the same. And after each category, you can um, ask a question. You know, we'll, we'll take a pause and we'll see if you have any further questions about that. Let's go to income. Okay, beautiful. So debt to income ratios. Um, the ratios are for the most part the same. FHA and a lot of the government programs have scaled back slightly. Um, prior to, you know, if we were talking three months ago, we would have seen that an FHA loan, we could sneak it by at a 56 or a 57 debt to income ratio. And what that means is the total housing payment plus their other bills can go up to 57 or 56% of their gross income. Now, of course, gross income, everybody has taxes taken out. So those are probably pretty stretched to begin with. These have now scaled back to about 50. Most of our lenders are at 50 right now, um, which to me hasn't really changed my business all that much. Um, and there are creative ways to kind of, you know, we're looking at a lot of things like paying down debts to get debt to income in line. So that's one of those ways that we can be creative and maybe just re um, format the loan, put a new spin on it and see if we can get it to fit in those new debt to income ratios. The next thing that is very important that is changing, verification of employment. So unfortunately, people are losing jobs. Um, that is real, that is happening. Um, so let's talk about that. We are doing verification of employment. So in the beginning, my job when I get somebody on the phone, of course, I'm asking the question, are you working? Are you still working? Because a lot of the times the people really don't understand that if they are collecting unemployment, that we do not consider that income. Yes, they're still having a check come in, hopefully. Um, you know, but no, I've heard them say like, oh, I, I'm on unemployment. I thought that was still income. I didn't know that that didn't work. Um, so that is number one. Number two is, you know, if you're still working, are you still working your full hours? Because some people used to work um, and they get 40 hours a week plus overtime. Well, some employers are now not offering that overtime that they had before. So if we will ask those questions, it is our job to find out what does your working situation look like? Are they going, um, you know, is overtime not available? So if you have a customer who is um, in the pre-approval stage, please double check and have them continuously check in with their lender. Let them know what their current state is because if your pre-approval amount used to be 250, well, maybe it's gone down now because they're not working overtime or maybe they are furloughed. Maybe they used to work five days a week and maybe they're now furloughed one day. So maybe they're only working four. It doesn't mean that the deal is over. It just means we might need to shift their numbers slightly. Um, so have them check in. I have told all of my borrowers to just keep in close contact with me. I am talking to my borrowers more now than I ever have before, just to make sure we are qualifying for that particular property at that particular time. So that is really important. From our end, we're looking for trends. So we are looking to see, you know, when we are getting the most updated pay stub, are they working their current hours? Are the, is it trending down? Where is it going? Um, and that is a big, big change to see what income looks like. Um, the other thing I wanna know is of course, we are queued into certain industries. So there are certain industries right now that we know are still working. I mean, if, I'm, if I have somebody who's a teacher, a lot of them are union employees, they are still getting their full pay. That's very different than somebody who might be self-employed or an Uber driver. Um, you know, there's just, there's different industries that are being hit in different ways. So 
that's something we're cued into and kind of listen for those tips and feel free to bounce those questions off of your loan officer to, you know, kind of ask, where do we go? My borrower mentioned they drive for Uber and maybe they're not driving as much. How does that change? Denise, we do have a question. Um, when uh, the borrowers go back to work, will the break in employment work against them? It should not. So we will need 30 days of a pay stub. So we do ha I have people who are on the sideline now. They were um, temporarily furloughed. They work in a doctor's office. They are going back as soon as they can. Um, and I just have them waiting. So in the meantime, and we'll get to that, but they're doing things like fixing their credit or saving money and they're doing all of that. And then once they are back to work, we'll verify. And we need to make sure that we have a 30 day pay stub before we can close. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Okay. Any other question regarding to this topic? Okay. Yes, I just have a real quick one. Sure. Uh, do you hold applications or they have to really do it exactly at the time that um, everything is being processed? Does it, can it be on, hmm, so in the works for two weeks or three weeks or it has to be ready to go in a week? So it's always, you know, um, and the reason I just went, hmm, is because of course, so pre, pre-approval wise, yes. I take that full application, me personally, I'll have the application, I have all my documentation, um, and I will just update it. As it relates to you on your side of, you know, getting under contract, they, we know they all have dates. So if you know that they've gone back to work, it's just 30 days of a pay stub before closing. So before we will clear to close, we need that 30 day pay stub. Um, as long as that is within the contract dates, we're good to go. Any other questions? Okay, Denise, continue on. Beautiful. Um, can you switch the slide, please? Thank you. Okay, so assets. We can, there's not a lot to report here. Of course, um, for now, anyway, assets stay the same. Um, all of our programs are open. All of our programs, there still are 100% financing programs available. Um, of course, if people are putting more money down, we still need to verify them in the same way. The only thing that I am seeing at all as it relates to assets is um, sometimes people don't feel comfortable going into the bank to get their statement, but really everything is available online. I am coaching more and more people how to access documentation online. But aside from that, there is nothing else that is changing. Um, you know, it's just a change of lifestyle more than anything else to see, you know, I people used to go in the bank to get statements and now I'm coaching them how to access those documents online. Um, there's an asterisk at the bottom that says reserves may be required. We're not seeing these yet. Of course, there's chatter. Um, it really comes into play with things like self-employed borrowers, somebody who may have varying income to give the loan picture a full stable loan. So if income is varying, they might wanna look and see, do they have assets for reserves? So that if their income does take a decline slightly for a short period of time, do they have enough reserves in the bank two months, three months or so to cover their mortgage payments. So we'll see what happens there. We will keep you updated on that. Nothing really to report yet. Denise, when, when you say the reserves, um, what, what dollar amount does that equal to? Perfect. Um, yes, and that is a good point, Wayne. Thank you. Um, if I ever start talking in mortgage speak here, um, of course I talk these things every day. So I, if I ever forget or I start talking in acronyms because there are, tons of them in the mortgage industry. Um, yes, please ask me because it's not intuitive to everybody. Um, so reserves, when I mention reserves, it is typically, it's the total housing payment. So if the mortgage payment is $1,500 and we wanna see two months reserves, we need to see $3,000 left in the bank after closing. Okay. So after you're closing, all your closing costs are paid, do you have two months reserves in the bank? Um, and again, that is not a requirement yet. It's just sometimes that helps with the approval as we're looking towards the total picture. Um, it is obviously less risk 
if they're not using every penny that they have. That that, that makes some sense. And I'm presuming that's the taxes, the insurance type of uh, payment when you say, okay, thank you. Yes, thank you. Total month. So that's, you know, the principal and interest, taxes, insurance, and mortgage insurance if that's required. Yes. Any, Any other, other questions? questions or concerns before we move on? Okay. Okay. Beautiful. So we'll move on to credit at this point. Um, beautiful. So this is probably where you're seeing the most changes. I know I personally have been restructuring some deals, not only of my own. Um, I will, I will make a shameless plug right now that we are, I have gotten deals from other lender friends. So being in the industry since 2008, I have met a lot of really great loan officers along the way. Um, and I have lots of other friends who are also in the lending industry. Um, I have gotten a lot of second chance deals handed to me within the last few weeks, just because other lenders, this is really where this is changing. Um, so of course we have the big players in the game, that's the investors, the ones who are actually backing the money they're guiding the way. So there are, um, you know, your big players. And when I say that, I mean, you know, Chase and Wells Fargo and all the, the really big um, investors in the game. They're making their own guidelines or their own overlays to, you know, what maybe used to be a 600 credit score has now really changed to be something like a 660. And then we have lender overlays, which that is the particular mortgage company that is also putting their own. So maybe the investor is at a 640, but they decide they are going to be at a 680. Um, so this can change and it really depends on what the lender or your broker is willing to take the risk. Um, and that changes. So we here at First World, have, we have a general guideline of government programs 660 or greater. Although, I say this and it's officially not in writing, but we still have fantastic relationships that if the quality of the loan is still in such good shape other with other factors, so we talk about those as compensating factors. If there are other compensating factors, we are still able to place loans below our typical guidelines. So I can't tell you up front, it has to be on a case-by-case -case basis whether we still have channels for that, and that is changing day by day, hour by hour. But if any of you after this call wanna call me to see, I had this deal, there are 657 credit score and my other lender just said sorry. Um, I'm happy to look at those and we are still finding homes for a lot of those loans. Um, the next thing I wanna talk about is Chaffa. Some lenders have cut off the Chaffa program entirely. Um, those lenders feel like there are there's too big of a risk um, to do a state bond program. That is not a Chaffa thing. That is exclusively a lender thing. Chaffa is still open. They are taking new reservations. They are closing loans. Um, their turn times are fantastic these days. Um, it's like one to two days. So if you have somebody who can maybe be put, in, be put into a Chaffa program, that is a great option right now because they have not yet put out a credit overlay whatsoever. Um, so that is really cool. And then we talked about rescoring, which of course is if you have somebody who's close, right? Um, we have the opportunity, we have the software to look very, very specific. Um, you pay down your Capital One card to, you know, this dollar amount and your credit score will increase by seven points or whatever the case may be. Very, very specific. Then we get that updated statement with the new balance, we push it to the credit bureaus and they go ahead and we'll do the automatic rescore. Denise, I have a, a quick question to go back just a moment on the CHFA piece. Yes. Um, when you're talking about their underwriting turn times, is that because of the way we underwrite the file or is that something separate? Good question. Okay, so Chaffa is, we underwrite in-house for all regular Chaffa. So those are called lien loans. Um, and we can go through, you know, Chaffa guidelines if anybody wants, you know, updates on that in general. I am always happy to. We are the number one Chaffa lender in the state. So we do Chaffa 
really, really well. Um, and they're not always the easiest loans. Um, so if we can do the hard stuff, we can definitely do the easy stuff too. Um, right. But back to Wayne. So we could do some of them in house. Anything with a DAP, down payment assistance, will go to Chaffa. So we underwrite the loan in house. We do that all ourselves. Once we have determined that the file is clear of all, all conditions on our end, the entire package gets sent to Chaffa for their approval or their blessing. Um, they review the entire file again, then it gets sent, sent back to us for a clear to close. So that is the chapel approval that I'm talking about. So after our regular turn times, we then send to Chaffa, wait for their turn times before it gets sent back to us for clear to close. So it's just those loans that have the down payment assistance, but if it exactly. didn't, then we wouldn't, we would underwrite it in-house. Yes, sir. Correct. Thanks. Yep. Any other questions? Okay. Moving Beautiful. on. Okay. Collateral, otherwise known as, um, you know, what secures the loan. So that is your house. Um, appraisals. We are, we are not getting away from appraisals on any purchase transactions at this time. Um, appraisals are still required on all purchase transactions. I will say, um, you know, there's the asterisk on the bottom there. For anybody who just, you know, is talking about refinancing or you hear it, just so you know a little bit because you're in the industry and I know sometimes I get asked questions about things that are definitely within my realm, but somebody knows I do something with houses. Um, so the same thing, there are escrow waivers, I mean, um, appraisal waivers for appraisals now for refinances. We could do drive-bys, but not on a purchase. Um, what we are seeing, our appraisals are done. Um, their turn times are still fantastic. We're not seeing any issues there. And our appraisers themselves are taking safety. They know they don't want to put themselves at risk or anybody else who is involved. They are going out there with masks, with gloves. And the one thing that we would ask um, as real estate agents is when you are in the property, if you can just make it as easy as possible, um, make sure that the appraiser has access to everything, doors are open, um, you know, just do whatever you can do to make sure that they don't have to touch things or open things up. I mean, as, as best as we can assist them to get on in there and out quickly um, without causing too much disruption to, you know, the homeowner's house, um, that's probably the best thing. But appraisals are still going on every day, coming in, normal turn, line, turn times, not much has changed. Questions on that? Questions? Okay, no questions, on we move. Beautiful, okay. so here's, here's another big thing that people are talking about, and this information is changing daily. Um, and this is another one of those things that has to do with each attorney and what they are doing, what there's their state guidelines, um, and then there's individual offices. Um, a lot, I would say almost across the board, a lot of our attorneys are doing um, curbside closings, which really sometimes mean that they have set up picnic tables outside of their office. They are, of course, masks, gloves, bring your own pen, um, as best as you can, just regular safety precautions. But a lot of the times they are doing them. Um, I had an attorney meet somebody who had a pickup truck and she was like, no, I am good. I will bring it a clipboard. I will flip down the bed of my truck. And they stood out in a parking lot somewhere. Um, if there is a will, there is a way. And they did on the back of her pickup truck. I mean, if it is what it is, um, she was happy, the attorney was happy and everybody kind of moved on. Um, there are some attorneys out there who are doing e-closings. And the reason, again, that I'm hesitant with my words there is there most or some of the documents can be e-signed, but they, we are still in a state where our some of our documents require ink signatures. There's no way around it 100% yet. Um, we think that day may be coming. They are working through that other states have allowed it already. As of Connecticut, we are still ink signing at least some of the forms. Um, in certain situations, power of attorneys are possible, um, but that again is on a case by case. 
the only thing I do want to let you know, and there's a note there about 11 a.m. or later. The reason for that is because we are doing same day of funding verification of employment. I know I touched on this earlier. Employment is what it is right now. I mean, we are, people are losing their jobs and we will not send the wire until we have verification the day of closing. So the funding will not take place. We do all of our calls between 8 and 10 a.m. And then, and then the wire will be sent before their closing. So closings for first world anyway are 11 a.m. and after, just to make sure that we have those same day closing, I mean, same day verification of employment. Any questions? No questions, onward. Beautiful. Okay, so I know I touched on a few programs as we've been going through. Um, I just really wanted to go quickly again. FHA has seen some changes. Um, and when I say um, FHA, a lot of this is mirrored with a lot of the government programs. So when I say FHA, most of the time I also mean VA and USDA, although there's some exceptions because they are different programs. Um, FHA is standing for first world at a 660 as our base. Remember that we, you know, we'll look at holes to see if we can find homes for other loans that are maybe close, but not quite there. Um, and then 50% debt to income, that is your total, total bills for the month. Housing plus all of your other bills must be 50% or less of your gross income. So, um, Chaffa, this has, this has kind of been my, um, golden child for the last month or so. And you know what, there's so many people who are nervous of Chaffa, who don't really know um, how Connecticut Housing Finance Authority works. Um, because there are, there's a lot of moving pieces. There really are. Um, it's a unique loan. It's a special loan. But if you have a borrower who fits this very niche pool, it is a fantastic program to use, especially now. I would be more than happy to explain to any of you what these guidelines look like, what these, um, you know, kind of how the program works and how you can sell it on your end. Although really, if you want to just send them to me, I'm happy to sell it for you. Um, people steer away from it because they think it's complicated, because they think it's hard to get approved. Um, in my personal opinion, it is more documentation, um, but it's kind of like, when you apply for scholarships for college, right? I mean, you got to put in the extra, the paperwork, you need to take the extra time, write your letters of explanation, and yet it's better rates. It is lower mortgage insurance in a lot of these cases if we do the Chaffa conventional. I mean, the program is fantastic and they don't have the overlays. So if we can make something fit, it can be a real game changer for um, where we are today. Denise, I have a question. Um, I thought CHFA was only for low income um, or something like that. What? That is that not like? true. Thank you, Wayne. Um, that is not true. I mean, a, a hard no. So I had somebody who called me. She called um, last week and she said, I've been told by two, I've been denied by two um, mortgage loan officers. And I said, did you actually apply? And she said, no, they wouldn't even really talk to me about it. They said I made too much money. So I was like, really? Like, what do you make? And she said, oh, I, you know, I make like 92 a year, $92,000 a year. And I said, oh, okay. And she goes, they said, it's just too much. Um, and the truth is that's not too much. And that, that's a pretty good earning. Um, so she has two boys at home. So she is now a family of three and, you know, Jaffa income can go up to like, I shouldn't quote this without having it in front of me, but we're over a hundred if we're on three or more. Um, I believe somewhere upwards of like 115 or 116. Um, and that is real money. It is not a low income program. Um, it is a moderate program and there are a lot of people who fit it. So it's, um, it's a really cool program. There are, um, there are asset restrictions, but you can't have more than 10,000 in the bank. Um, after closing. So it's still, I mean, it fits a lot, a lot of people. Your, your purchase price can go up to, you know, it's different per county, but it is not a low income program to say the least. 
um, to that assets piece again, um, would retirement funds be counted in that limitation? They are not. No. Oh. So they, if they are liquid funds, so sitting in a savings account, sitting in, you know, a regular bank account, um, though, that's what we're looking at. So, and that is only if you're doing the down payment assistance anyway. So you were only, if you have money in the bank and you are qualifying for a regular program, that's okay. Um, it is only if we are talking about the 100% financing with the down payment assistance. Thanks for clarifying. Um, any other questions out there? Seeing none, next. Moving on. Beautiful. USDA is another one of these programs that I sit here and I smile because the program actually makes me, maybe I am, um, you know, one of those corny mortgage people, but this program is exciting to me because it, you can fit really cool things. So USDA, and I'm not sure if you know, has a regional loan center. So if something fits outside of their normal box, you can call them. Um, we call them, we have our underwriters who get on the phone with them. Um, and I will have something where I say, I call my underwriter on the phone and um, because they're local, by the way, we have local underwriting. Um, so I will get them on the phone and say, hey, I just got this weird situation. I think I can make it work. You know, it doesn't really fit our guidelines, but this is why it makes sense. Or, you know, I will look and say, but you know what? So I know it looks like this on paper, but really in life, this is why. And every situation is unique, right? So everybody has a different um, story. And if I can present that story in such a way that my underwriter goes, oh yeah, you might have a case there. We can pack us that up. We, our underwriter will get on the phone, call to USDA or send an email to USDA. And we need approval, a regional approval from a person sitting on the other line at USDA who can individually make exceptions. Um, that is a really, really cool thing about USDA that can sometimes, where other investors, other guidelines are a hard no, USDA will make exceptions for the right situation. So this is a program that allows case-by-case -case basis. And of course, I should mention, um, I assume so, but USDA is for rural housing. So it doesn't fit to any of the, you know, um, towns, I mean, cities, but it definitely, there are even towns on there that might surprise you that still fit in the rural mark. Quick question uh, again. Um, so when you say rural, does this mean like it's a, like a farm? <laughs> well, actually it can't, it cannot be a farm. So it can't make income off of the program, but it just means there's a map. Um, we can go through that too, but it just means that it is not a, a town. It's not a town with a lot of people living in it. So a town like East Windsor, for instance, surprises people often. Um, East Windsor is still on the USDA map, Summer, Suffield, um, and any of the towns that kind of, if you take the Hartford core and kind of just expanded anything kind of on the periphery and the exterior outside of the Hartford. But there's a map and I'd be happy to share it with any of you. Any other questions on USDA? Beautiful. Okay, so I know I just touched based on a few of these as I went through my program, um, how First World is able to do these things. So I just mentioned that we have, there are certain investor guidelines. There are some things that don't change. They are in black and white. Those are guidelines. Now, um, I always say to, there's, there's guidelines, right? And then, so there's underwriting guidelines and then there's common sense. And they don't always mesh very well. So there's some things that are written in black and white that, gosh, you just can't figure it out. And yet, if you think creatively, if you have a way to look at it and to package it in a different way, we're able to get it in under the guidelines. We're not doing anything wrong. We're not doing anything against the rules. Um, it is just sometimes putting it in a different way so that somebody else on the investor guideline would go, would agree with us to say, oh, yeah, I didn't consider looking at income that way. Or maybe I didn't consider this, um, you know, it's typically around income or something. If we can package it in a different way or get creative on how we can get it to work, our underwriting team here is phenomenal at doing that. I can't tell you my previous companies, um, 
it just wasn't an option. I worked for companies who you would submit it to an underwriter who was in another state, maybe somewhere, and you had to put it in. You couldn't talk to them. Um, we are creative here enough that I, we're small enough that we like each other here. Um, and I know that sounds so silly, but and it doesn't really maybe make sense, but any of you who are from a small brokerage probably know that feeling of family, right? And First World feels like that. So my underwriters and I are, are friendly. We, I'm able to pick up the phone and I can call any of them. And I know that they will jump in and take a look at something for me. If I say, hey, another lender just declined this, I think I can do it. Can you take a look? They'll say, gosh, Denise, I'm in the middle of a file and I just have to say, please, this one's important. And they will most of the time jump in there, review all my income, review all my assets, um, and we can get a, an underwriting answer. I mean, even if it's a verbal, and I can communicate that back to you to say, yeah, I checked this one out. As long as it document, you know, I can document the story that I was just told, I think we have a pretty good chance of doing this. Um, and that goes under the, you know, make sense underwriting. That to me is if we can, if we can push something that makes sense, we will likely do it. Um, the rescore part, I talked about this a little bit with the credit. There are, there are ways that I'm not sure if it's just because other lenders, um, just kind of look at it like eh, that's a little too hard you know fix your credit and come on back to me i can tell you myself personally i love a good challenge i guess so i will go back and i say please i'll get my borrower on the phone and i say please don't please don't be discouraged we're going to get there we will get there together and then i check in right so i check in every 30 days hey how's it going where are you where are you with this so this rescore um it makes a huge difference. I mean, if you have somebody who's at a 640 and we can get them above 700, it opens doors to other loan programs. So that that is something available to um, everybody who applies, who has a credit report pulled, we can rescore and see if that gets them better interest rate, better mortgage insurance rates, et cetera. Um, and then the last thing I'll mention on here is home repair escrow. Um, this is something we're coming out of winter but this is for something that maybe first world definitely does things different here where we're willing to do a repair escrow for something that maybe couldn't have been done um you know in the winter time or if there is something that can't be fixed right away our company will allow for repair escrows post closing but they're case-by-case -case basis again but those are the small unique things that we do here differently that other places wouldn't even consider any other questions from the audience? Okay. Okay. And then this last piece, it doesn't really go into, you know, kind of your current state of lending, but it, it does. And here's, here's why this fits in today. Um, we have this program that is called Listing Pro. It is a really cool program when it talks about, it's the photography for your listings. So we will send a professional photographer out to your listing to take photos of your listing. And when you do that, um, we pay for a portion. Your cost is only $40 and then we pick up the rest. So we will do that. But how this really ties in is a lot of our photographers are now doing 3D virtual tours for virtual open houses. They're doing the program, the, um, the map of the property. So you can go ahead. Um, so you're not expecting, you know, a big buyer pull through that they can really feel that they have seen the property before they go in, which we know during these times are really challenging, right? We, people don't, sellers don't want to let a, a lot of people in their homes maybe, or maybe buyers don't want to go out. So if we can give you the opportunity, it is not included with the listing pro, but we've added it on as an option for you to pay for additionally. Um, you also get a co-branded marketing flyer, like an open house flyer talking about different loan scenarios. Um, and you also get your, a custom website link that you can post on social media, shows all the pictures, the pricing scenarios, etc. So if anybody has questions about that after as well, feel free to reach out to me. Do you have any uh, questions on, on Listing Pro that we can answer? Or any questions. Or any other. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
I don't have anything else here. It looks like we're all set on questions. Thanks, everyone. I um, really appreciate it. If you have any other questions, uh, Denise, her email address, um, Denise at firstworld.com. Um, and her cell number right there as well. So we read out. And thank you for attending. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate day. your time. Stay well. Stay well.